How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we ought to have a few moments of silent prayer to make sure everybody's in fellowship, ready to focus on the study of the word, and then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come together to study your word, to be strengthened and encouraged in our spiritual life by an examination of the truth, and that it is the truth of your word that God the Holy Spirit uses to teach us, to mature us, and to advance us spiritually. We pray that tonight we might be able to focus and concentrate, put aside the uh, distractions of our day-to-day lives in order to put our attention on what you would have to teach us this evening. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are in Genesis chapter 48. We are getting ready to have, a, have the end of Genesis in our sights, but between now and the end of Genesis, we have an extensive uh, prophecy in chapter 49 related to the history of Israel. So we'll slow down a little bit as we go through chapter 49. Just to give you a preview of coming attractions, I am uh, considering a study of Colossians once we finish Genesis, just sort of flip over into the New Testament for a little while and begin a study of, of Colossians. Chapter 48 and 49 form a unit. The unit in these two sections deal with the passing on of the blessing from Jacob to his sons. Chapter 48 f- focuses on the passing of the blessing from Jacob to, to Joseph. Remember what has happened within the family. The oldest son was Reuben. Uh, because of Reuben's uh, incestuous act with the, the concubine of uh, Jacob, he is no longer a favored son. But, and, and Joseph is the next to youngest, actually, but he's still uh, younger than all of the other brothers, and he is the one who is in the position to receive the double portion, the inheritance that goes to the preeminent one, to the firstborn son. Remember, that terminology, firstborn son, doesn't refer to uh, first in order. It refers to uh, priority in terms of inheritance. It's more the idea of the preeminent one. So Joseph becomes the one who will receive the double portion, and that's the focus of chapter 48 because the blessing from Jacob goes to Joseph's two sons, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. And that gives him a double portion so that when you read the list of the 12 tribes of Israel, you never read of the tribe of Joseph. You read of the tribe of, tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. That's that double portion blessing that goes to the firstborn, who in this case is Joseph. The other thing that we see that comes out of the 49th chapter as Jacob outlines the blessing for the other sons, is that Judah becomes the preeminent one there in the announcement that the scepter that will not depart from the tribe of Judah, that Judah will be the ruler uh, of the tribes, that the ruler of the tribes will always come from the tribe of Judah. This, of course, foreshadows and predicts, prophesies the Davidic kingship, which culminates and the eternal kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The focus in these two chapters is on the blessing. Remember, we go back to the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is the interpretive foundation for everything in Genesis, from Genesis chapter 12 to the end of Genesis. But the Abrahamic covenant is truly the interpretive framework for understanding everything in the Bible from Genesis 12 to Revelation chapter 22. You must understand God's unconditional permanent covenant with Abraham that he will provide him with a permanent piece of real estate, the land. And every time you see that terminology in in, in context related to Israel throughout the Bible, 
we have to always think of physical real estate. Covenant theologians come along and they say, well, you know, the Jews rejected Jesus, so they don't get the promises. They forfeited them. So the land, when you get into the New Testament, that, that really is a code word allegorically for heaven. So wait a minute, wait a minute, let me get this straight. So God promised Abraham a piece of real estate, but then he does a, a bait and switch on him and says, okay, instead of getting the land, you're going to get heaven instead. And so, however, Abraham understood the promise isn't how it's actually fulfilled. Well, what does that have to do with the integrity of God? And that's the problem, one of the underlying problems with the entire structure of, of covenant theology. God fulfills his promise we see in Scripture precisely as he gave it. So that where we do see fulfillment in Scripture, it is always literal. And when we uh, then have unfulfilled prophecy, we know that it must also be fulfilled in a literal manner. Well, part of the uh, promise of God to Abraham is that he would be a blessing to all nations. And this is part of the major one of the major themes throughout the book of Genesis from Genesis 1 to 50 is this theme of blessing but you have blessing as God blessed the animals Genesis uh, 1 God blessed them and he and God said to them be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it well actually in Genesis 1:18 he told the animals to be fruitful and multiply. And then in Genesis 1.28, he told man to be fruitful and multiply. Uh, the uh, concept in both passages is related to blessing. This is the Hebrew word barak, which is used some 75 times in the book of Genesis, indicating it's a major theme of God's blessing. It's used seven times in chapters 48 and 49. So 48 and 49 deal with that continuation of the blessing. After the Noahic flood, God blessed Noah and his sons, and he repeats to them the same thing he said to Adam at the beginning when he created Adam and Eve. He said, be fruitful and multiply and subdue and fill the earth. Now, there are those who have said he didn't really mean that because they couldn't get pregnant in the garden. Now, I don't know how would it would have worked if Eve had gotten pregnant in the garden, but if he didn't mean be fruitful and multiply and to man in Genesis 1.28, then he didn't mean it. I don't have a slide for it. He didn't mean it in Genesis 1.22 when he said it to the animals. So he had to, either he was telling them to do something they could do or he was just, hmm, bumping gums? I don't know. What was he saying? So you have to take this literally. That's one reason I think that the time that they were in the garden wasn't very long. Uh, we, you know, I always come back to the fact that we want to, only since, only since evolution came along and historical geology do people want to put a lot of years into the period before the creation of man and a lot of years into the time in the garden to somehow uh, get things to, to uh, fit with, um, oops, Sorry about that. To get things to fit in, in the Scriptures. So they're commanded to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The same thing is repeated in Genesis 9-1 after the Noahic uh, flood, after the, uh, with, with the Noahic covenant. And then there's failure at Babel. And the next time this concept of blessing and being fruitful is mentioned is in connection with the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis chapter 17, we have this uh, reference twice. God promised Abraham, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. Then again in um, chapter uh, 20, he bless, uh, verse 20 of chapter 17, he blesses Ishmael. The same way, remember, Ishmael is still of the uh, of the seed of Abraham, and even though he is not the promised seed, even though he's not the promised line, God still had a blessing for, for Ishmael. Uh, just because he doesn't get the firstborn blessing doesn't mean he's, he's ignored or put out on the rubbish heap. Uh, verse 20 is, For Ishmael I've heard you, behold, I've blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly, 
He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. So there are these promises of blessing throughout Genesis. In Genesis, um, I may have that in the wrong place. In Genesis twenty six twenty two, we have another uh, blessing mentioned, where. Uh, Abraham, Isaac is, um, recognizes that God has made him blessed and will make him fruitful in the land. Genesis 28.3, Isaac blesses Jacob just as Jacob is getting ready to leave the land to run away from Esau as Esau is breathing fire and wants to kill him. Jacob leaves the land and heads for uh, Padan Aram. And Isaac says to him, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you may be an assembly of peoples. I want you to notice this connection between God blessing them and making them fruitful and multiplying them. Because what happens in these last two or three chapters of Genesis is the stage is set for this explosive multiplication that takes place between Genesis and Exodus. Genesis thirty-five eleven, God appears to Jacob, and this is an important chapter to remember, two, two important chapters with Jacob in chapter 28 and 35. 28, as he's going out of the land, headed to Padanaram, he stops at Bethel, he goes to sleep with a rock as his pillow, has the uh, dream of the stairway to heaven, the angels going up and down, and God... Uh, reiterates and reconfirms the Abrahamic covenant with him at that point, promises to bless him, make him a great people, and to bring him back to the land. Genesis 35, he's on the way back into the land. And in Genesis chapter 35, he, God again reiterates that promise. So all of this is built on these continued repetitions and reaffirmations of the promise uh, to, to uh, Jacob. And that's the backdrop as we'll see in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 48 for understanding this formal ceremony that is taking place where Jacob is going to adopt Joseph's two sons as his own. And he will adopt them and they, and they will be his just as Reuben and Simeon are his sons. So they become equal with, within, the, within the family. So Joseph is then broken down. Now, what we see here, just to give you a couple of ideas on how important this is to the rest of the Old Testament, as the chapter focuses on this double portion blessing to Joseph's house, we see historically the outworking of this because Ephraim and Manasseh become the two most powerful and populated tribes in the northern kingdom. Remember, of the 12 tribes of Israel... You have ten in the north and two in the south. When Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam becomes the king. And when Rehoboam becomes the king, he listens to all the young uh, foolish advisors who say that, oh, we, we really need to increase the treasury. Let's increase taxation to solve all the problems. It's funny how uh, people always think government can solve the problems by increasing taxation. But Rehoboam was young and foolish, and he didn't understand economics very well. And so he followed their advice. This created a major problem within the uh, kingdom. And Jeroboam I, who is an Ephraimite, Jeroboam, who's kind of a radical in the north, comes back from exile and leads one of the first tax revolts in history. And the ten northern tribes of Israel separate themselves from the two southern tribes. Judah and Benjamin become united in the south and are known historically as the kingdom of Judah. And the ten tribes in the north become the northern kingdom, usually referred to as Israel. But there are passages where the northern kingdom is referred to as Ephraim, and there are passages where the northern kingdom is also referred to as Joseph because the two prominent tribes in the north are Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph. And I want to take a little diversion here to go to a passage where we see this in the, in the uh, Old Testament. So hold your place here and let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. This is one of those things that I've 
I don't think I've ever addressed this or ever put it on tape, and it ought to be there and somebody will index it and someday somebody will really need to have this information. Years ago, when I was in college, it's getting to be longer and longer every year, I had a friend of mine who sort of got cornered by a couple of Mormon missionaries. And they just had her all twisted up and she didn't know how to answer some of their questions, so she called me. Like I knew what I was talking about when I was 21 years old. And so I came over to talk to these Mormon missionaries, and they threw something at me that I had never heard. Now, I didn't know that much about Mormons at that time. And those of you who have an opportunity to interact with, uh, um, with, with any Mormons or want to know something about it, I recommend a book by Dave Hunt. Uh, what's the name of that book? Do you remember? Godmakers. Godmakers. That's what it is. For some reason, I just drew a blank. Godmakers by Dave Hunt. It's an excellent book. It's also a video. And it is a tremendous book, about, and it'll expose a lot of things about Mormons that Mormons don't even know they believe. And it's a, it's a great book. But one of the things they'll come at you with comes out of this this utilization of the terminology of Ephraim and Manasseh and Joseph and what's in Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, what's important to understand here is what is happening in the context of Ezekiel at the end of, of, of this part of Ezekiel. And that is, it is a prophecy related to the future restoration, the future regathering of the nation and restoration of the nation and what will happen at the end times in Israel's history. And in the middle of this section that's dealing with the, that, that uh, regathering, you have the uh, passage in Ezekiel 37, which is the famous dry bones passage where the uh, prophet says that he was set down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones, and the, while he is watching it, the bones began to live and began to come together. And this, of course, was the inspiration of a, a very popular song back in, uh, back in the 50s, and I will not sing it for you. If you're not old enough to remember it, you, have a, you can get on the internet and find it. But, you know, the ankle bone is connected to the leg bone, and the leg bone is connected to the knee bone. That's what this came out of. So just to let you show once again that our culture has some connection to Christianity. Loose as it may be. Well, if you just jumped into the middle of this chapter with no understanding of, of context, you might get fooled. In verse 16, we read, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it. And this is what you write on the stick. For Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. So that's one stick. Then you take another stick and write on it. For Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. See, there you get that connection. The stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel and his companions. So Joseph, Ephraim, Israel are all used synonymously in that passage. Then verse 17, Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. Now, you know what the Mormons do with that? They'll tell you a stick. Well, that's what a scroll's wrapped around. So this is really talking about a scroll. And what you're talking about is the stick of Judah. Well, that's the Bible that Christians have. The stick of Joseph. Now, that's, gee, that's Joseph Smith. <laughs> that's the Book of Mormon. And that's the other uh, revelation that's over here. Don't you just love their slick commercials about how they love Jesus Christ? You know, that's why I say, you know, you got to be careful. I always ask that question, who, who, what Jesus are you talking about? I always somewhat facetiously refer to the fact that I had my fence moved around my backyard, and I said, Jesus did it. Came over one day, and Jesus moved the fence. Of course, he's hot, Jesus Gonzalez, but you always have to define who Jesus is that you're talking about. Just because you call somebody Jesus Christ doesn't mean he's Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus HaMashiach, that we have in the Bible. And, but this is something that if you've never studied anything about Mormonism, and you've never had anybody teach on this passage and point out this particular application, you're going to go, okay, how do I answer that? Hmm, I have to get back to you. So, 
I don't think I ever told you one of the biggest disappointments in my life one day. I've always, you know, we all, I think we all have this little yearning in our soul to have a really good, good, solid theological confrontation someday with one of the guys, the guys who comes and knocks on our door from uh, one of the cults, whether it's JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, or Mormons, or something like that, and about, and I think this was in 1988 or 1989, John Ankerberg shows, some of you are familiar with Ankerberg, uh, he does shows on apologetics on TV, John Ankerberg was going to film a debate between Gary North and Gary DeMar defending Christian Reconstructionism and post-millennialism on one side, and Dave Hunt and Tommy Ice on the other side. And so Dave and Tommy, I was living, pastoring in Irving at the time, Dave and Tommy came into town and stayed at my house, and we had our big war council, and we uh, prepped for the debate. And then um, Harry Leaf, who some of you know from here in Houston, Harry came up. And so here we are in my house. Just We just have, were having prayer to go to the debate. And... Uh, there was Harry, and here Dave Hunt has written a number of books on the cults, on Jehovah's Witnesses, and of course the God Makers on, on uh, Mormons, and then Tommy and, and my son. We've all studied Greek and Hebrew. We all know all the issues, and we're just getting ready to go out the back door and get in the car, and there's a knock on the door, and it's a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. That was just a great disappointment because I just had to send them on their way. And what fun that would have been that day. Anyway. Well, sometimes it's helpful just to kind of be exposed a little bit to how these other groups misuse and abuse uh, Scripture. And that's what they do. And most Christians don't have a clue how to respond to any of these overtures. And, it's, and the other part of the problem, especially with Mormonism, is that the Mormons have this, uh, at the very core of Mormonism, is a, is a mysticism. And so if you are uh, particularly out of a couple of different denominations and, uh, or religious groups in America that are uh, quasi-mystical, you know, Jesus told me this and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and that kind of verbiage, it sets you up because the key thing in Mormonism is they'll appeal to you and they'll say, you're going to know it's true because you're going to have a burning in the bosom. Just like Joseph Smith had. And that's their, that's their phrase. you got this burning in your bosom. And I remember about oh, 20 years ago now, I was in Palmyra, New York, which is the birthplace of Joseph Smith. And that's you have two big Mormon sites there. The cabin where he grew up and then you have the hill where the angel Moroni appeared to him and gave him the tablets for the Book of Mormon. And so I went there, and we, I went up on the, on the hill and saw the huge statue there to the angel Moroni, and you had this guide, and I had a guide who was this little 78-year-old uh, curmudgeon of, of a man, and he's taking me through it. He just, every time he would say something, he'd say, now you're just going to know this is true because of the burning of your bosom. He said, I used to be a Southern Baptist. And I said, you know, the largest number of converts come from Southern Baptists because they don't teach you the Bible. Every time he'd say that about the burning in the bosom, I'd always say that. But that's what happens. He'd say, you're just going to know it's true. And see, what happens is these denominations set people up for failure by having this quasi-mysticism. And then somebody comes along and says, you know how it's true? It's true because you, you feel it inside. Just like that song, you, uh, he lives, you ask me how I know it's true, he lives within my heart. See, that just sets you up for that kind of mysticism. Okay, well, the, what's happening here in Ezekiel 37 is it's talking about the future restoration of Israel and the union and reunification of the northern kingdom of Israel with the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom is represented by this one stick, that's Joseph, Ephraim, the house of Israel, and then the other stick is Judah. And these sticks aren't scrolls or scripture, they're sticks that are designed to represent the two nations. And then the prophet was to join them together into one stick. It's part of the restitution of the nation. They come back as dead as just dry bones, no life, in the first part of the chapter, and they come together gradually, then sinew, then muscle, and then they're breathed upon. Oh, what's that? That's regeneration, finally. 
In other words, the nation comes, of Israel is going to come together prophetically first as unregenerate. And then it will be breathed upon and they will be regenerate. That's exactly what we see in history. We see an unregenerate nation there now, but eventually they will become a regenerate people at the end of the, of the tribulation and there will be a unification of the, of the nation. Verse 18 of Ezekiel 37 we read, And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these things? In other words, explain the symbolism to us. Ezekiel is told to say, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it with the stick of Judah and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And so that is the point of this section is the reunification and restoration of the nation. And then the next chapter is going to talk about the battles that take place with the, with the uh, Gog uh, attack, the Gog and Magog attack against Israel that I believe takes place towards the end of the tribulation. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 48. This is, our, this is where we get this terminology. So this event of passing on of the blessing to Manasseh and Ephraim in chapter 48 is important for at least establishing the terminology that we'll find throughout the rest of the Old Testament. The first usurper to the throne in Israel's history was an Ephraimite, and so we know that Ephraim, Manasseh, play a vital role down through the history of, of, down through the history of Israel. The Ephraimites, which was another term for Israel, had Samaria as their capital, and so we see in these two chapters here a prefiguring of the, or foreshadowing of the dominance of the sons of Joseph and Judah. Next time we'll get into the uh, blessing on Judah. Now as we start chapter 48, we see the, the setting has to do with Jacob in his, in his old age. Let's just pick up a little context. Go back to the last part of chapter 47. We're told J J Jacob and the sons have all moved down from the land of Canaan. And we're told, so Israel dwelt in the land of, of Egypt. Now another thing you should note is the interchange between calling Jacob Jacob or calling him Israel. You have two different things that I think go on in the Old Testament. When he's referred to as Jacob sometimes, that's referring to him. And he's really functioning carnally in Israel. He's functioning uh, more spiritually. But another thing that happens is that when he's called Jacob, like in this chapter, uh, that is emphasizing his, Jacob as Jacob the individual. But when he's called Israel, that's sort of a clue that what's happening to him has national and historical significance for the nation Israel, which is what happens here. When it says, so Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, you're also thinking the nation is dwelling in the land of Egypt, as you read it in light of later history. They lived in the land of Goshen. And then 28, and Jacob, see, it now comes back to the individual as less than the corporate idea. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. I pointed out that was the same amount of time Je Joseph lived in the house of Jacob before he was sold into slavery. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. His father lived uh, to be 185. Uh, Abraham had lived to be 175. So you see this deterioration of the age. Said verse 29, when the time drew near that Israel must die. So he is near the end of his life and he is making preparation for the end of his life. That's a very important doctrine we'll come to with the end of this chapter, point of application, is that we always need to be ready to die spiritually and just in terms of normal physical uh, and business and family application, that's what's happening here. He wants to make sure that what needs to be done is done before the Lord takes him home. So when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now I have found favor in your sight. Please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. This is a sign of taking an oath. It's a very solemn, 
formal occasion. And he is, makes him swear that he will eventually take his uh, re physical remains back to uh, Israel and to, uh, back to the land of Canaan and to bury them there. Now, just after this, he's ill. He's gradually dying. Verse 1, we read, it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And so he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. These are, were both born to him, you remember, when he was in Egypt. And this begins to set up a context here. I want you to note that verses 1 through 12 uh, give us our first unit. If you outline the chapter 1 through 12, uh, deals with Jacob's adoption of his two grandsons as full heirs. And verses 13 through 20, the patriarch will then bless uh, his grandsons, now his sons, following the principle of the elder serving the younger. And then the last two verses of the chapter represent his confident assertion that they will indeed return to the land that God has promised them in the land of Canaan, and they will eventually be buried there. He also bestows an additional blessing or land grant on Joseph in those final verses. So he's going to bestow a blessing, and in that culture, the bestowal of a blessing by a dying patriarch had irrevocable authority. We see similar examples in Genesis 22.20, and also in Joshua 24, 29. It has all of the description of a formal audience as Joseph the father comes in with his two sons in front of him. Jacob is told that your, your son Joseph is coming to you and he strengthens himself, raises himself up on his bed. This section is marked between these two events of Jacob uh, sitting up on the bed and then in verse 12, Joseph bowing down uh, to his father. So Jacob begins the uh, ceremony and he does so in something that smacks of a covenant type of ceremony. He is going to remind, uh, a, uh, remind Joseph and the, his two sons of the Abrahamic covenant and how God had established that covenant with him as well, how God had reaffirmed it with him at Luz, which is Bethel, which is uh, wh where he slept on, on the rock, where he had the vision of the uh, Jacob's ladder. What? Bless. There's that term again. See, this whole chapter revolves around the outworking of the seed promise and the blessing promise and the lands in the background because they're going to be, there's a confirmation that they'll be going back to the land. So God, in chapter Genesis 28, God blessed Jacob, promised him a multitude of descendants and the land of Canaan as an eternal possession. By adopting Joseph's two sons and by reiterating this blessing to them, they come into the line of the promise from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and now to the two sons. Now, Jacob is recognizes here that the blessing isn't, isn't his. The blessing is from God. He says in verse 3, Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty El Shaddai. This was an early title for God used primarily in, uh, in Genesis. We've studied this before a few times. Shaddai, God is called Shaddai in, um, in Job. And it refers to his omnipotence, his authority. Uh, there's a, we're not sure all the dimensions of the name, but that's the primary idea is he is the almighty God. So he says, El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. The blessing is divine in its source, and he is the channel of blessing. Now that's a very important principle for us to recognize, is as believers, we have to recognize God is going to bless people whether we're around or not. So you get the option of either being there and being part of that channel of blessing or not. Your next door neighbor may get saved. Now, is it, are you going to get the privilege and opportunity of being part of that blessing by giving him the gospel? 
But if he's positive to the gospel, God's going to get somebody to give him the gospel. Now, either you're going to be a part of that situation and be involved as a channel of the blessing, or somebody else is. So the issue is, are we going to be part of it and get to uh, enjoy that uh, being used by God, or are we going to be in rebellion? So Jacob recognizes that principle, that he gets the privilege of being in that path of blessing and passing it on to his, to his descendants. When Jacob returned to the land from his time with Laban, he re-entered the land at that same point. He has the uh, situation where he wrestles with God, the angel of God, at Peniel uh, in the Transjordan area, and then he came back across the Jordan, and he went back to Bethel, and there he built an altar to God, and God again revealed himself to Jacob, renamed him Israel in Genesis 35.10, God said to him, your name is Yaakov, Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And then God goes on to say, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Notice the connection between what uh, Jacob says here in verse 3. God Almighty, El Shaddai, appeared to me. And God said, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you and to your descendants after you, Ephraim and Manasseh, I give this land. So Genesis 48 is directly connected to Genesis 35 and back to Genesis 28. So in verse 4 we read, and God said to me, Jacob says, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Direct quote from the episode in Genesis 35. Now he connects that to Ephraim and Manasseh in verse 5. Your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine adoption, as Reuben and Simeon are mine in the same way. They're not just grandchildren. I am adopting them on par with you with a full, the full inheritance rights of a, of a brother. So the two sons now become historically known as the sons of Joseph and are equal par as tribal heads with the others. The two sons establish their inheritance. We see this in Numbers 26, 28, and Deuteronomy 33, 13 through 17, and in Joshua 17, 17, in the conquest, they're clearly set up as equal tribes. And the rationale that he gives for this adoption is because of the premature death of his beloved Rachel. In verse 7, he says, But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way. And you remember that was when she gave birth to Benjamin when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. Ephrath was the Canaanite name for Bethlehem. So this terminology is used again in Micah 5.2. We're told that the Messiah will be born. He whose goings forth have been from everlasting will be born in Bethlehem Ephrathah. So there was kind of a compound name sometimes, but Ephrath is the, the pre-Jewish name going back to, to uh, Canaanite times just as Bethel the house of God, was originally named Luz. That's the Canaanite name. So you see this, this name interchange. Then in verse 8, we see the adoption uh, per se and the preparation for the blessing. Joseph's two sons are presented in verses 8 or 9 as they're brought forward to him so that he can bless them. And in verse 10, we're told that the eyes of Israel were dim. Who does that remind you of? Isaac, see, there's all these little, little things that are brought out to kind of connect the dots with earlier events and earlier patriarchs. His eyes are dim like Isaac's eyes were dim, and Isaac couldn't tell the difference between Esau and Jacob, and so Jacob tricked him. Now Jacob's eyes are dim, and he's got two boys in front of him, but he knows what he's doing, and um, he's going to pass on the blessing the correct way within divine viewpoint. 
So he has him bring him forward. His eyes are dim. He couldn't see. Joseph brings them near him. He kisses them. He embraces them. It's a wonderful family scene. In verse 11, Israel says to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact, God has also shown me your offspring. It's a reflection on God's grace and his grace orientation. This is, remember, this is Yaakov, the heel grabber. This is the manipulator, the deceiver, the one who's always trying to get the blessing, connive for it. He was always trying to came up, come up with some deal. He, he bought the, uh, he, he sold the mess of pottage to Esau. Then he disguised himself when he went into his father and saying, give me the blessing. This is the master manipulator. Now he is relaxed. He understands the bla- uh, blessing of God in his maturity. He is a mature believer and he is completely relaxed in God's grace. God has provided richly for him in restoring his son and not just his son, but his grandsons. So Joseph brings them forward uh, beside his knees, and, and Joseph bounds down with his face to the earth. That's the first section, setting us the, the adoption itself in preparation for the blessing that comes forward in verses 13 through 20. And here's a scenario. We covered fairly quickly. Joseph brings the two boys up, and he's looking at his dad, and his dad's left hand is here and his right hand's here. So he's going to uh, arrange things so that when he brings them forward, he's going to move Ephraim on his right, his dad's left, and put Manasseh over here on the right side because Manasseh is the older. Joseph hasn't quite grasped the principle of the older serving the younger yet. So he arranged them that way, but, but Israel understands what's going forward. And when he gets ready to bless them, what Israel does is he crosses his hands. Because he's going to bless Ephraim as the, uh, he's going to get the primary blessing. He's the younger. And Manasseh will get the second one. So in verse 14 we read, Then Israel stretched out his right hand, laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. Now this brings in the whole doctrine of the elder serving the younger. What's the principle there? Is God's going to do it, What God's going to perform his plan God's way. God's wisdom surpasses the wisdom of man. Human viewpoint, the human viewpoint practice was the law of primogenitor, that the eldest always received the double for, portion and the inheritance. But God is going to work differently because he's teaching a lesson that it's based on grace and not by works. And so Ishmael, who's firstborn, serves Isaac, who is the promised seed, and the younger. Esau, who was the first one of the twins to be born, serves Jacob, the younger. And Joseph, Joseph's brothers all serve Joseph in fulfillment of that dream he had back in chapter, chapter 37. And now Manasseh will serve Ephraim. Ephraim will be the dominant of the two tribes. And then he, as he crosses his hands, he blesses Joseph because Joseph is the father and the blessing is going down through Joseph. So he blesses Joseph and says, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. Walking before the Lord is a sign of living before God, living a, a positive spiritual, a spiritual life. God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day. He recognizes that God is the one who sustained him during all those years that he's out of the land, some 20 years that he was out of the land when he's up there with Laban and trying to work off the bride price for Leah and getting tricked into Leah instead of Rachel, then working off the bride price for Rachel, and then continuing there for another six or seven years. All those years he recognizes God was always with him, just as God had promised him at Bethel. And that's the reality for every one of us, is God never leaves us or forsakes us. He is always present. He, the promises that we have in the New Testament are just as affirming, just as focused as those personal promises to Jacob that God would be with him to accomplish his plan and purposes with Jacob while Jacob was out of the land. So Jacob recognizes that this is the God 
who has fed me all my life long to this day. In verse 16, he is the angel, and God is referred to as the angel at Bethel, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. And the, this is the first time we have a use of this word in... Is this thing not on back here? I switched it over, but I don't have a signal. I won't worry with it. This is the Hebrew word ga'al, G-A-A-L. That's okay, Jack, don't worry about it. Uh, Ga'al. And ga'al is the verb for redemption. You have two words in the Hebrew for redemption. You have ga'al and you have pada, P-A-D-A-H. Ga'al and pada. The noun form of ga'al is go'el, which refers to the kinsman redeemer. And Redeemer always carries with it this idea of paying a price to deliver or to rescue uh, someone. And so that's, this is the first use of Ga'al as Isaac recognizes that it is God who has redeemed him for all, from all evil. It is a clear salvation statement as you get in the Old Testament that it is God who has paid the price, or actually it is a prophetic, or it's a, it's a historic uh, use of the word that focuses on a future fulfillment as, sure, as certain as if it had actually been accomplished. And he says, bless the lads, let my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So it's a clearly passing on the Abrahamic covenant, the Abrahamic uh, blessing to his grandsons who are now adopted as his sons. Verse 7, Joseph reacts, well, wait, 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 you, you're blessing the wrong one here. So Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim and it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head, trying to straighten it out instead of crossing his hands. And Joseph said, not so, this one is the firstborn. You put your right hand on his head. But his father refused, in verse 19, and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people. So see, when you give the primary blessing to one that doesn't exclude the other from all blessing, he's just not going to get the double portion, the primary uh, inheritance. He says, he that is uh, Manasseh will also be, be great, but his younger brother, Ephraim, shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude. It's not nations. It's, it's the, the Hebrew word goy, which you know you, you, most Gentiles know they're goyim, which is Gentiles. But the word goy is also used to refer to Jews. Right here, the descendants of Ephraim are called goy. It's, it has that, it's translated into, into uh, Greek with ethnos, and it should be translated in context like this as people. Uh, as a large group of people. He will become a multitude of people. So verse 20, in summary, he blessed them that day, saying, uh, by you Israel will bless, saying, may God make you, uh, by you Israel, and he's using the term Israel there to refer to the future nation Israel, Israel will bless one another in the name of Ephraim and Manasseh. By saying, may God make you, as Ephraim and Manasseh, they're going to be so prosperous and blessed that they will become, it will become proverbial that people will say, if you really want to be blessed, it'll be, may God bless you like he blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. Then we have our closing in verse 21 and 22 where Joseph gets a special land grant. Israel said to Joseph, behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Of course, he won't go back physically. He will go. His body will be returned just as Jacob's body would be returned. And, he, and, and this would also be fulfilled, not historically, but it will be fulfilled prophetically. Jesus shows us how to interpret this in the Gospels when he's asked by the, by the Sadducees about resurrection. Jesus said, God said, I am, present tense, 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, Jesus said. God is the God of the living. What Jesus is doing is he's exegeting the verse and saying, look, this is a present tense verb there. When God speaks to Moses in Exodus and says, I am, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if there's no resurrection, God would have said, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because by 1400 B.C. they'd been in the grave for five or 600 years. So this fulfillment of this promise to Joseph did not take place historically because Joseph died in Egypt, as we'll see at the end of chapter, at, at the end of chapter 50, and this fulfillment will come to Joseph in the resurrection in the millennial kingdom, that he will receive an extra portion above his brother's land that uh, Isaac took from the Amorite. We're not told about the historical situation there, but apparently there was one piece of real estate which he won through some sort of small battle with the Amorites in the land of Canaan. Now that brings us up to a, a conclusion on his blessing for those sons, and I thought I would just make some application here related to dying well, the doctrine of responsible dying, and we'll go through this uh, fairly quickly here at the end of class. First point, a believer should be able to face the reality of physical death with objectivity and courage because he knows that he will be absent from the body and face to face with the, with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5.8. You should not have fear of death. There should not be concern, worry, anxiety. It's amazing how many people just don't want to think about their own mortality. A number of years ago, I worked for a couple of years for uh, Earthman Funeral Home here in Houston selling pre need funerals. And I learned that most people are in incredible denial about their own mortality. I'm not going to die. I don't need to plan my funeral. So you're going to leave your poor wife when she's out of her mind in grief to have to deal with all these decisions? What kind of man are you or the other way around? Are you going to leave this with your kids to have to make all these decisions and pay all these prices just because you're so arrogant you don't think you're actually going to die? It's just amazing. People in their 80s, you want to go ahead and plan your funeral now? No, I'm not, not going to happen to me. Hmm. Just put my body in a, in a hefty bag and throw it out by the street. Yeah, yeah. What reality are you living in? It's just amazing. People just flee from responsible thought about their own death. But believers should be just the opposite. What a testimony. I remember there was a lady who used to sit in front of me in church. She was in her early 80s. And she realized that someday and someday soon, she was going to die. What objectivity years of doctrine provided her. And so she decided that she would do the responsible thing for her family, for her children, for her grandchildren. And so she sold her house, she liquidated all of her possessions, and she moved into a retirement village. Retirement village that had also uh, some nursing care and a nursing home so that if indeed she were to get worse and worse, that they, she would be taken care of and would not be uh, an inappropriate burden for her family. So she lived there for six months and had a stroke major stroke, and she went into that nursing facility for about three months, and then the Lord took her home. But everything was taken care of by her family. That is a wise woman who has applied doctrine and loved her family. And that was just such a great testimony. But very few believers are willing uh, to do such a thing. So first point is a believer should face the reality of death with objectivity and courage because he knows the reality of his physical death. Second point, as such, a believer should responsibly provide for and take care of his family in the event of death, whether expected or unexpected. That means you, whether you're married, divorced, single, young, old, you're going to die. You may die tomorrow. Do you have a will? Have you laid out all the plans? Does anybody know what you want to have done at your funeral? You know, that's a tough thing. As a pastor, I do lots of funerals. I every now and then you get a mature believer and you actually know some things. So you ought to think about it. That's what a wise believer will do because you're oriented to uh, reality. Third point, this means a believer should have an up-to-date will. You should have a living will. Your finances should be properly taken care of. You should have an inheritance to be left for your children. 
I've heard believers say, well, as long as my life and my money run out at the same time. Is that what God says? Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth, wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. The point is, a good man supplies an inheritance for his children and his grandchildren. That's how wealth is built. And they're not living for today for themselves. They're living also for the future generations. And if you're the one who takes care of finances, you should have all the accounts listed for your spouse. Uh, a little bit I had to do with the funeral business. What I realized is usually one person or another handles all the bills, handles all the accounts and everything. They die and the other person's gone. I don't even know where the bank account is. This especially happened in older families, World War II generation and older, where usually the man handled all of that and the wife didn't have a clue. And that's, that was always tough. There should be communication on these things. Things should be written down. If you're a parent, maybe you're a single parent now, uh, you should discuss this with your children. Discuss the details and preparations for your funeral. Who do you want to conduct your funeral? Where do you want it to be conducted? What songs, you know, plan out the whole thing. Right, so it'll be done the way you want. If you're a mature believer, you want the gospel there. I know most of you. You want the gospel proclaimed very clearly at your funeral. What plans have you made to do so? Frequently when I conduct a funeral, I'll say, if so-and-so were here and could come back right now, this is what they would, they would say to you. Of course, I'm just making it up. Why don't you write a letter? Make a video. Get a DVD camera. You can tell everybody right there, I'm in heaven right now. <laughs> Cousin Bill, you never trusted Christ. You better do so right now. <laughs> Aunt Lucy, you atheist. I'm in heaven. <laughs> Have some fun with it. But what a great opportunity to, to almost come back from the dead and give, your, give everybody the gospel. But nobody ever does that. Write a letter to your children, to your grandchildren, to your great-grandchildren, something your grandchildren can preserve and give their grandchildren to talk about the priorities in your spiritual life and what doctrine has meant to you and what the Word of God has meant to you and what it should mean for them. Set up a, leg a spiritual legacy uh, for the future. Another wise thing to do is to distribute your valuables before you die. If you're getting up into senior years and you're in your 80s and you decide, you know, I've got some valuable china, valuable uh, silver, I have valuable rings, jewelry, whatever it may be, real estate, don't wait till you die to let the kids fight over it. Go ahead and give it away before you get there. So there's, you know, avoid some of that problem perhaps. Um, you need to face approaching death with objectivity and courage from doctrine. Another thing to consider, and a fourth point, is you should seriously consider leaving some of your estate for the furtherance of the gospel, for missions, missionaries, ministries, and local churches. This is something that's gone on down through at least the last couple of hundred years, and many great churches and ministries and missionary organizations and seminaries have been built on legacies that have been left from uh, spiritually mature believers who, who utilized the resources, the inheritance that God had given them uh, for, to establish ministries for the future. Fifth point, something should seem obvious, provision should be taken in the eventuality of nursing care. We live in a world today where frequently... People have one or two children, and one's in New York, and the other's in, in uh, California, and you're in San Antonio. What happens if you start to glitch a little mentally? That's not a pleasant thing to think about, but it's a reality. You begin to, to get some form of dementia. You expect them to drop their job, move halfway across the country, and come take care of you? Uh, we need to think about these things. They're not always the most pleasant things to think about, but... But there's nursing home insurance. There's all kinds of things like that that, are, that we, should, we should focus on. Uh, sixth point is for the elderly, you should take some time to have private discussions with your children, with your grandchildren, to alleviate whatever fear and anxiety that may come their way at the time of your passing. Make sure they understand the gospel so that when they come together for that funeral, it's a time of joy and rejoicing and celebration. Make sure they understand exactly what the Bible says transpires at the time of death. 
And then seven, something I alluded to a minute ago, is perhaps you should write a short letter or have something filmed, recorded, that uh, where you explain the gospel in your own terms to those who come to your own uh, memorial service to make sure that the gospel is given clearly. That's what Jacob's doing. He is passing on the inheritance. He is leaving something for his children and his grandchildren. And the most important aspect is the spiritual legacy that he makes sure they understand when he dies. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time to study your word. Uh, the things that we've been encouraged with as we see your faithfulness in the lives of these patriarchs and you still exhibit that same faithfulness to your promises in our lives. We pray that you would encourage us and strengthen us with the things we've studied this evening. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.